I mean, it's a great thing that runs through all your work. You're you're, you're very interested in and poetry in particular. Mm. Um, it seems to be a thread that you find a lot of inspiration and a lot of a lot of information actually from your understanding of in particular the romantic poets and that sort of you know, Wordsworth and so on. Indeed, I mean. Poetry is a magical performance because it works at different levels. It, it combines the sound and the meaning. So it's multi-layered. And like, like many of the things which suddenly take us out, opening, as Keats puts it, magic casements on fairy lands forlorn, forlorn. Just that phrase, opening magic casements on fairy lands forlorn. That immediately you're with Keats or Yeats or whatever, you're in a fairy land, just a string of words like let's pretend. And it does that by the music, by combining, you know, all those things, rhyming and rhythm and um, the music of the sounds and the associations and so on. So it's terribly powerful, um, as powerful as painting or any of the other arts. And so I was brought up in a poetic household, fortunately, and I went to a poetic school where poetry was highly valued. And so it's a form of inspiration and uh, reflection and every day I read a poem. And what it shows, um, again, thinking of this truth, non-truth, mm -hmm. it shows the ridiculousness of the binary. Because if you say, is owed to a nightingale, true or untrue, you know, you can't apply that binary to poetry. It's both true and untrue at the same time. And it's a willing suspension of disbelief. So moving on to the next mm. on the list. Postmodernism, post-structuralism. <laughs> ah, you found my list. Yes, that's the ones. <laughs> now, um, we, we are, we've sort of absorbed that into our blood to a certain extent, and most people know, know about uh, post, post, post. But at the time, which is the 80s, I suppose, mainly, um, it was a bit of a shock mm. because um, it started, no doubt, in literary criticism and elsewhere, but it soon got into anthropology. And there were books, you know, called Writing Culture and things like this, and uh, even later Geertz and others, which said that um, basically um, what we write is terribly subjective, that um, it is true for us, but it's not true for anybody, necessarily true for anybody else. And the concept of a a truth outside there which we are documenting um, or a structure out there which we are documenting is a fantasy. So it makes it very subjective and you, you all know the connections. I mean it seems to be looking back on it now quite a, a strong echo from existentialism um, from an earlier period, very subjective view and for a while it almost laid waste anthropology because there you were, you went out, you did your field work at great personal sacrifice, you came back, you started writing your monograph on it. And people would say, well, okay, Alan, this is your point of view, but of course, no one else would see it like this. And it's highly subjective and so and Gellner, on. Gellner's push, I mean, he wrote quite a lot about this, didn't he? And was quite critical of it. And he, his pushback was, Yes, everything is subjective, but some things are more subjective than others, and this is <laughs> this is too subjective. Yeah, well, that's true. But he, he put it even more extremely, which I I found appealing. Which he said that that's sort of true, um, but it's also true that some things don't seem to be at all subjective. And the example I gave, and he gave, was walking through a closed door. Now, if it's all in your mind, and you can just say to yourself. You know, the the door is not closed. I, I don't think it's closed. Bang, you go straight into it and it still is closed, whether you think it is or not. There are things out there mm. which um, are not constructed by us. So 
we do construct a great deal in our minds. And it is true that, if, uh, as anthropologists found, that two people going at 20 year intervals to the same society with different questions in mind, like Robert Redfield and Oscar Lewis, find different villages because they ask different questions. But if they'd gone at the same time and if they'd asked the same questions, or um, they probably would have seen a lot of overlap. So subjectivity is there, but um, some things are more subjective than others. And we now have learned to live with postmodernism. I don't know, we've absorbed it. And like most paradigm shifts, we've tried to retain good bits of it, but not at first you overreact against things. And then you like post-colonialism or post-imperialism, and then you come back to a middle position and say, well, the critique was obviously partly right, but let's not throw the whole system out. Okay. But of course, some people would say that it's postmodernism that led to Trump and has led to um, post-truth and, um, you know, kind of false fake news and all this kind of stuff. And so I, I guess the, there are things in the Gellner critique of it that still are still important today, even though perhaps postmodernism itself has, has kind of faded a bit. Um, there, there still seem to be some of the people that went with the postmodernist thing used it for advertising and now using it to kind of subvert institutions and things that perhaps would prefer them not to. Well, I think that's probably true. And you, you may be able to throw more light on it than me because I know nothing about punk. Mm. But, but um, from as you described it in our last interview, punk and that generation you grew up with was a knocking down of all certainties in a certain sort of way. You know, the, the flower power generation in which I'm more familiar had ideals and certainties of the kind. Yeah. And then um, a movement came saying, that's, let's get rid of all that hegemonic thinking and let's just let everything rip. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes, I mean, it was more, it, it, it was more kind of, we were kind of like Thatcher's children, really. It was, it, we just felt everything was corroding and corroded and there was nothing to hold it together. And we didn't believe in what the hippies had told us because all the hippies now seem to be very successful business people. And we were kind of, it was kind of like a lost generation. And I think what's happened since the punk thing um, has, is, is that, now everything seems to be very, very subjective. Uh, I mean, if you look at what's happening on the on social media and stuff like that, you know, you, you can you become a social media star just by being famous. You're not famous for anything except for being <laughs> famous. Uh, you know, you've got millions of followers and oh, so on. That was Andy Warhol, surely. And Andy Warhol. Well, again, I think Andy Warhol is also part of part of all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think this is the where I think Gelner was coming in because obviously Gellner didn't say anything about the punks where I mean he he I think he he would have seen uh, well I think he saw certain aspects of the post um the postmodern and post structuralism and he could see that part of it was a liberation because it it corroded um the old traditional ways of you know marriage and and relationships and, and all that kind of stuff but it also corroded things like rule of law and uh, things that and the authority and this sort of stuff and i think he saw that as a as a as a problem for especially for the anglosphere because it didn't have any counter counter balancing ideology you know he used, to, he used to say you know we haven't got anything that we can it's not like nationalism where you can kind of wave a flag and beat beat the drum of of some sort of race stuff you've just got fridges and cars and that's about it <laughs> when when you said you were thatcher's children well it was it was it was kind of by i mean punk really was the glory days in the 70, mid 70s i mean it was it only lasted for about three years really and then the rest of it was just fashion um and it was it, it was just a 
it was more like a kind of nihilism, as you say, what it really was, and um, linked to a kind of do-it-yourself ethic. Um, yeah. Don't trust anybody, just make it up yourself. I see. That's where it links with Thatcher. Yeah. 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 